Episode 19 August the 26th, 1914 The Unseen Killers at Le Cateau by Private R.G. Hill Read by Guy Parker Private R.G. Hill went to France on August the 22nd, 1914 with the 1st Royal Warwickshire Regiment. Except for a few days in hospital in 1915, he served in this battalion until April 1st, 1917, when he was wounded and discharged medically unfit in March 1918. His story of the wild fighting at Le Cateau and of the nightmare of marching in retreat creates again the epic of the contemptible infantryman of 1914. We detrain just outside Le Cateau station. The town was in confusion as Mons had just been fought. Refugees, troops and ammunition columns creating a dust that choked us. Civilians offered us jugs of weak beer, but discipline was so strong that to accept it meant a court-martial. We marched out of the town along a typical French road. Just when we were about all in, a halt was called for dinner, which we never had as an outburst of artillery fire was heard. It must have been miles away, but we had orders to open out to artillery formation and proceed. We saw no enemy that day, and at night bivouacked in a cornfield, where we enjoyed a long delayed dinner. We marched off in column of fours next morning at dawn in a new direction. At noon we halted, piled arms and rations were issued, the last for many days. Men were told off to dig trenches on rising ground to our left. Whilst so engaged an aeroplane hovered over us. It had no distinguishing mark and we thought it was French, but was soon disillusioned as it scattered coloured lights over us. Too late, we opened fire. Soon, large black shells were bursting in the beet field just in front of our improvised position. Rain then started, the shelling ceased, and a regiment of our cavalry came galloping up and jumped over us in our hastily constructed trench. We stayed there till nightfall, incidentally wiping out a small Uhlan patrol that blundered upon us. When we withdrew, we could hear the jingle of accoutrements of many men approaching. That night we seemed to march round and round a burning farmhouse. Day broke and we were still dragging our weary limbs along in what seemed to us to be an everlasting circle. At last the word came to halt and fall out for a couple of hours rest. We had been marching along a road with a high ridge on the right and cornfields on the left. High up on the ridge ran a road parallel to ours on which one of our regiments had been keeping pace with us. We had no sooner sunk down in the cornfield on our left than shrapnel began to burst over us. Our officers were fine leaders. Man the ditch on the road, came the order. In the meantime, the battalion on the ridge had been caught napping by a squadron of Uhlans, who charged them while they were falling out for a rest. Our eager young officers went frantic with excitement. On their own initiative, they led us up the hill to the rescue of our comrades. With wild shouts we dashed up. At first the ground was broken and afforded cover for our short sharp dashes. We then came to a hedge with a gap about four yards wide. A dozen youngsters made for the gap unheeding the advice of older soldiers to break through the hedge. Soon that gap was a heap of dead and dying as a machine gun was trained on it. We reached an open field where we were met with a hail of shrapnel. Officers were picked off by snipers. A subaltern rallied us and gave us the order to fix bayonets. A piece of shrapnel carried half his jaw away. Upwards we went, but not a sign of a German. They had hidden themselves and waited for our mad rush. Officers and sergeants being wiped out and, not knowing where the enemy really were, our attack fizzled out. A staff officer came galloping amongst us, mounted on a big black charger. He bore a charmed life. He shouted something unintelligible, which someone said was the order to retire. The survivors walked slowly down, puzzled and baffled. They had attained nothing and had not even seen the men they set out to help. We lost half the battalion in that wild attack. Then came our turn to do something better. The survivors, under the direction of a capable major, dug in and waited to get their own back. A battery of 18-pounders started to shell the ridge, Suddenly, shells started falling around the guns. One direct hit and a gunner's leg fell amongst us. The battery was wiped out. 
Tired and worn out, we waited. Towards afternoon, shrapnel played on us. Fortunately, without serious result. Then it was our turn to laugh. German infantry were advancing in close formation. They broke at our first volley. Something seemed to sting my leg. I found a shrapnel bullet had ploughed a shallow groove down the fleshy part of my thigh. The enemy advanced. Another volley, and they broke again. My leg began to pain me, so I hobbled along the road to a house which was being used as a dressing station. A long queue of wounded men were waiting to be dressed, while a crowd of thirst mad and unwounded crowding around a well in the garden. Despairing of medical aid, I begged the field dressing, and catching sight of a sunken road, there dressed my wound. In this sunken road I found battalion headquarters. At dusk they retired, I with them. I learnt afterwards that all our wounded were captured that night, and small bodies of our troops, trying to retire in the darkness, had fired on each other. This was our part in the Battle of Le Cateau. Then began the retreat. I must have fainted, for I remember hobbling along with my chums, and next I found myself tied to the seat of an ammunition limber. We came to a village jammed with retiring troops, where an artillery officer bundled me off. Fortunately, some of my own regiment passed, and seeing me lying in the road helped me along. My legs seemed easier, and I was able to proceed at the pace my footsore companions were going. It was nightmare marching. Our party was now about 150 strong. Sleep was out of the question, and food was begged from villagers. Reaching saint Quentin, we had great hopes of rest but we were told that we were surrounded. We lay down to die through sheer weariness, but a staff officer rounded us up and got us out just as the enemy entered. Tramp, tramp again. Engineers told us to hurry over the bridge at hand, as they were about to blow it up. A little scrap a bit further on, then Noyon, where we snatched a night's sleep.